The aerial combat during the Great War I gave life to numerous legends about flying machines and the men who flew them. It was a result of my passion for flying. For to fly into the sky had been man's dream for ages. Also, the domain of dreams belonged to the time when the knight was the live example of all virtues and nobility, courage, and devotion in defense of the weaker and the abused. Most of us will remember the Excalibur, King Arthur's legendary sword, or Don Quixote, the knight errant of La Mancha's brave horse, Rosinante. The knights of the Great War were pilots of aircraft called fighters. Their weaponry and charger in one was the aircraft or airplane as it used to be called. The lance and the sword had been replaced by one or more machine guns. They only lacked armor. The combat was one-on-one. -on -one. Pilots would do aerobatics to obtain a good firing position and to prevent the adversary from achieving the same. The airplane had to be fast and agile. Fights would usually take place in the presence of many spectators, soldiers who were hiding in trenches. The exchange of fire on the ground would stop. Everyone watching the breathtaking aerial strife, which was very reminiscent of a fight between two dogs. Therefore such an engagement is termed a dogfight in the English language. One of the participants was usually shot down, the victor remaining airborne. One who had achieved five victories was called an ace. Fonk, Manik, Richtofen, Brumowski, Kazakov, Baraka, Rickenbacker, McKehonik, and Peter are names of aces, while Fokkers, Newports, Spads, Olfags, and Albatrosses were names of aircraft, or rather their designers or factories where they were designed and built. We will say about Newports. French aircraft which became famous and have found a prominent position in the history of the world and Polish aviation. The birth and development of the Newports. The designation of Newport is linked with the origins of aviation. A pilot and designer was one of the aviation pioneers. In 1909 he established the Societe d'Aerolocomotion Aircraft Factory in Ceresnes, manufacturing airplanes of his design. He was one of the few designers who preferred the monoplane layout with the smallest possible number of drag-increasing items. The first construction, the Newport I, did not distinguish itself in performance, but it was a kind of laboratory that enabled the designer to develop his new brainchild, the Newport II of 1910, into a machine singled out for its novel technical solutions. The fabric-covered fuselage with the pilot's seat so arranged that only his head would protrude above the fuselage or the landing gear with the wheels attached to a skid through a steel suspension spring. This solution ensured safe landings even in cases of having lost both wheels, which was not rare in those times. The aircraft's tail unit was not typical, either. The horizontal stabilizer was permanently fixed to the fuselage whereas the elevator was fitted separately at the end of the fuselage. It came with a doubled rudder. Control of such surfaces was complicated. When presented at the aviation meet in Reims, it was propelled by the air-cooled two-cylinder derrick rated at 14.7 kilowatts, achieving 72 kilometers per hour. In 1910, upon moving the factory to Issy les Moulineaux, the company name was changed to Societe Anonyme des Etablissements Newport. The next version of the aircraft was developed there, powered by a two-cylinder 20.6 kW engine. It was designated the Newport 2N. This new machine was a many-time world record breaker. On April 11, 1911, at Chalon, the pilot and designer in one achieved a speed of 119.76 km per hour. On June 16 another speed record is set at 130 km per hour, and still another, at 133.14 km per hour, on June 21. These were unimaginable speeds in those times, having been fitted with a 37 kW engine, the Newport 2G. Piloted by Belgium's Jan Olieslagers, a great war ace with the Belgian Air Forces, covers a distance of 625 kilometers. Another record was French pilot A. Gobes, a distance of 740 kilometers being covered. 
such distances were over 50 times greater than those covered by the best pilots in the best machines five years earlier. The Newport 2G's next success was America's Charles Wayman's victory in the Gordon Bennett Speed Cup race held at East Church, Great Britain, in 1911, with Wayman achieving 125.5 km per hour. The third place was won by Francis Chevalier in a Newport 2G. Edward de Nieport dies in a flying accident on September 16, 1911. The company is taken over by Charles de Nieport, who continues to develop his brother's concepts. The record ceiling of 6,120 meters achieved on December 28, 1913, by Francis Georges Leganieu was another success of the Newport II with a 59 kilowatts. Gnome Monosupape engine. Production orders flooded Société Anonyme des Etablissements Newport, making it known not only in France but also across the borders. But the owners of the company were doomed. Charles de Nieport dies the death of a pilot on January 24, 1913. His successor was Henri Deutsch de la Meurthe with Léon Bazin as his assistant. They develop airframes designated the Newport 42 and the Newport 6 floatplane. Both series produced for individual clients and the military. The Newport 4M, piloted by Wayman, was a competitor in a military aircraft bid to beat all the opponents. The French Army ordered no less than 10 Newports. The British ordered 5 for the Royal Flying Corps and 12 for the Royal Navy Air Service, 5 of the latter fitted with floats. Russia also ordered the aircraft, additionally obtaining a production license. Newport 4s also equipped units of the Italian and Swedish Air Forces. At the beginning of the 1914 warfare, Newport 4s constituted a significant part of the Entente Air Force's equipment. They were most widespread in Russia. The Newport 6, offered to the French Navy, underwent tests at Moulin. They were supervised by Navy officer Lieutenant de Viso Gustave Delage. He became so fascinated by aviation that he requested to be dispatched to the Newport factory, which happened on January 1, 1914. His energy and designer talent soon placed him in the chief designer's post. The first objective he set for the company was to build an aircraft for the coming Gordon Bennett Cup race to be held in the same year. Delage preferred the biplane construction, but not the traditional one. He used one large area plane plus a much smaller one. This solution was termed the sesquiplane in French. It featured a V-shaped interplane strut. The designer claimed that this solution ensured a much better performance and speed in the first place. Additionally, a pivot joint at the apex of the V-strut was to allow change of the angle of incidence and thus the adjustment of the aircraft's balancing. Today, there are still various views on the origin of the sesquiplane construction. Some authors ascribe it to a Swiss named Schneider, a Societe employee, who later left for Germany. In any case, this solution continued across the Newport designs till the mid-30s. Today, there are still various views on the origin of the sesquiplane construction. Some authors ascribe it to a Swiss named Schneider, a Societe employee, who later left for Germany. In any case, this solution continued across the Newport designs till the mid-30s. The aircraft was to be armed to fight the enemy in the air and on the ground. It was also to serve as a reconnaissance tool so important in this kind of warfare, as it allowed watching the rear enemy positions much farther than those available to observation balloons. On top of that, photographs were to be taken from the aircraft to provide lasting and certain evidence for analysis at the headquarters. The first half of 1915 saw the birth of the Newport 10, also called the 18 meters 2. This airframe became the basis of Delage's aircraft. The fuselage was a wire-braced wooden box girder. It had a rectangular cross-section with a rounded top and contained a two-seat pilot and observer cockpit. The front part was covered with plywood or aluminum sheets, the rest being covered with fabric. The wings were wooden, the upper one-two spar, 
the lower single spar, both with about a 3,030 feet sweep back. The spars were two moldings glued to a plywood strip. Two upper wing ribs near the inboard ends of the ailerons were reinforced. The ailerons were fitted to the upper plane only and mounted on a dia. 30 mm aluminum tube running almost along the entire wingspan to up to a cutout in the center section. The tubes ended with an oval lever connected to the control stick through push-pull rods. The lower wing was divided and mounted to the fuselage, whereas the upper was single piece and fitted to the fuselage using steel tubing. Both wings were connected by streamlined section ash V struts. Each strut was bound with cloth for added strength. The struts were attached to the spars by pivot joints. The wing cell was braced with steel wire. A flat profile steel tubing tailplane was fitted to the fuselage. The rudder was of the same construction. The tail unit had a characteristic shape. The control surfaces were activated by cords. The wings, ailerons, and control surfaces were fabric covered. The rubber cord shock absorption landing gear featured wheels mounted on an axle held by steel V legs as well as a tail skid in the form of a leaf spring mounted on a wooden streamline projection. The power plant for this machine was the Gnome or La Rhone rotary rated at 59 kilowatts, mounted in the front fuselage, and covered by a horseshoe cowling. Metal fairings were aft of the cowling. The navigational and piloting aids were few and conformed to the standard of the period. The Newport 10 did not feature an instrument panel, with the compass, chronometer, tachometer, and altimeter mounted in various places inside the cockpit. Two versions of this model were built. In the Newport 10th Avenue, the observer took the front seat, while the pilot the back seat. In the Newport 10AR, it was vice versa. In the beginning, Newports flew unarmed, taking only bombs, whereas the pilot or observer took a pistol or handgun for defense from a possible enemy. With time, machine guns became standard armament. The attachment of a machine gun was related to the situation of the observer. On the AV version, the gun was mounted in the front and there was a cutout in the upper wing through which the gun would fire. In time, the gun began to be installed on the upper wing using a special mounting. On the AR version, the gun was mounted in the rear cockpit on the Eteve gun ring, devised by the Newport Company, which allowed backward and sideward fire. The good flying qualities of the Newport 10 allowed its use as a one-seat fighter. The machine gun would be mounted on the upper wing using a special mounting so that it was possible to fire it forward or at an upward angle. This kind of mounting, however, proved troublesome when changing ammunition drums of the Lewis machine gun or cartridges of the Hotchkiss gun. The drum, initially containing 36, and later 47 and 96 rounds, could have been emptied at a very fast rate. It had to be changed if the fire was to be continued. Either the pilot or the observer had to perform this procedure standing up, which limited him in controlling the aircraft. Italian Newport 10s were armed with the Fiat Not Ravelli machine gun, installed on a modified mounting. The Newport 10 was not only manufactured in France but also under license in Great Britain, Breadmore Factory in Dalmure, Scotland, Italy, Newport Mackie Factory, and Russia Ducks Factory. Newport 10s equipped many French, Russian, Belgian, and Italian units as well as RNAS squadrons in Britain. They participated in military operations on the Western and Eastern Fronts, over the Aegean Sea and Palestine. The Newport 10 BIS were fitted with a 75 kW Monosupape engine. It differed from the standard version in that it had added seven openings in the engine cowling for better cooling. The aircraft's performance was not significantly in 1917, the Dux factory assembled a Newport 10 BIS with 81 kW and 88 kW La Rhone engines. These aircraft had bigger cowlings that protruded above the main outline of the fuselage. The use of the Clergent 9B engine rated at 81 kW or the La Rhone at 96 kW affected slight constructional changes, 
thus resulting in the Newport 12. This model was not much different from the 10. Most importantly, it had a more powerful engine, a bigger lifting surface, a cutout in the upper plane for improved upward visibility, and a cutout in the wing root section of the lower plane for improved downward visibility. The basic difference between the 10 and the 12 was the tube supporting the upper wing, mounted vertically on the Newport 10 and inclined by a few degrees on the Newport 12. The armament was identical to that used on the Newport 10, except that a Lewis or Vickers fixed machine gun was mounted on the front fuselage with the introduction of the Alcan synchronizing gear. The aircraft manufactured by the Breadmore factory had a vertical stabilizer and a modified rudder outline as well as a closed engine cowling. Apart from the combat versions, both models had unarmed training versions, too. Three versions were in production. N81E2, N80E2, and N83E1. Most often, however, training aircraft were classified by their lifting surface area. Thus, the Newport 23m2 was a two-seater with one or two control sticks. The Newport 18m2 was a single-seater with one control stick. All training Newports had rotary engines of various types and were rated under 75 kilowatts. They were often Newports 10 and 12 withdrawn from frontline service. The necessity to fight enemy aircraft and protect their own resulted in the birth of fighter planes. The simplest solution was to adapt the existing types by reduction of the crew members to one and installation of effective combat armament. A single-seat version of the Newport 10 was developed somewhat independently in France, Italy, and Russia. The common drawback of these versions was their relatively big weight, which, considering the low engine power of 59 kilowatts, did not ensure better performance than that of reconnaissance aircraft. Then the Type 16 could often be distinguished from its predecessor by the presence of a headrest. During development in 1916, pilots began to discover that the Newport 11 was inferior in speed and climbing ability compared to enemy aircraft. The obvious solution was more power and a 110 horsepower Larone engine was fitted instead of the 80 horsepower version of the Model 11. However, Despite the slight increase in performance, the Model 16 suffered a lot. Pilots disliked it due to the effect of the engine being heavier on the balance of the aircraft. Perhaps the most important Newport, Type 17 entered French service in late 1916. To address Type 16's defects, Delage lengthened the fuselage, increased wing area, and altered the shape of the upper wing. The Type 17 was very successful, serving the air forces of France, Great Britain, Belgium, Italy, and Russia. However, the Albatross D3 and DV were superior in most respects and the Type 17 was gradually withdrawn from combat service in 1917. The Newport 17 had a larger engine and, as noted above, area. Wings increase. The Newport 21 This aircraft is a hybrid aircraft with a baby fuselage and wings of the Model 17. This aircraft was produced in small numbers and is relatively rare. Most were issued to training units although a few went into combat service, particularly with the famous Escadrille N-124 and later the Escadrille Lafayette. Type 21 is superficially similar to Model 11 but can be easily distinguished from the latter by the use of parallel flight lines. The Newport 23 This aircraft is another evolution of the Model 17 and is virtually identical in appearance. In French service, Type 23 had an offset Vickers gun, distinguishing it from Type 17. In British service, both the Type 17 and Type 23 were armed with Lewis guns on the wings. A change to the structure of the upper wing of Type 23 necessitated modification of the mounting of the Lewis gun mount. This slight difference, in the absence of a visible serial number, is the only visual clue. The Newport 17 and 23 began to be superseded by the SPAD 7 in 1917. Both lacked the SPAD's performance and were more difficult to fly. 
to prolong the competitiveness of seaplane design. Newport produced the Type 24. The aircraft featured a 130 horsepower Larone engine, a circular fuselage, a new spoiler to improve lift, and, deriving from previous Newport practice, a plywood tail section, shaped like an elegant. The aircraft entered service after the Type 24 BIS and was withdrawn in early 1918. It is possible that the Newport 25 used by Charles Nungesser was the only one of its kind built. As for the Type 24, it was an attempt to prolong the life of the sesquiplane design. Style 25 is outwardly similar to Model 24. The main distinguishing feature is the rim of the underbody legs. Type 27 represents the ultimate attempt to improve on the basic design that has kept the Newport going since 1915. The Type 27 follows the Type 24 on the production line at Issy Les Moulineaux and is supplied to those Newport escadrilles remaining in 1918 to replace SPAD 13. Like the Model 25, the Newport 27 is externally very similar to the Type 24. The minor design modifications of Type 24 are the split shaft undercarriage and an internally mounted tailgate. The ailerons of the Model 27 have curved edges, a departure from the straight-line versions of previous models. In response to the dominance of SPADs 7 and 13, Gustav Delage abandoned the seaplane layout and designed a new fighter aircraft, the Type 28. A more powerful and larger 160 horsepower gnome. Monosupape engine wing area is increased to solve the corresponding traditional Newport problem shortcoming of low top speed and poor climb speed. The weakness of the sesquiplane would be addressed by providing a double lower wing and parallel struts between the planes. I would like to end my video here. The video is my research and research effort. I hope to bring you useful knowledge. And if you are someone who knows a lot about this plane, please comment below so I can understand more about it. I will try to improve the best in the next videos. As always, if you like this video, hit the like button to support us. Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to be one of the first to see my latest videos. And that makes me more motivated to make more videos. Maybe the voice in the video is not perfect, but the above content is my long-term research effort. I hope you understand so that I have the motivation to make the next good videos. And now it's time to hear from you.